日本の首相の名前を知らなくても、黒沢の名前を知らないロシア人はほとんどいないと思います。They may not know the name of the Japanese Prime Minister, but I doubt there are many Russians who do not know the name Kurosawa. Seven Samurai Yojimbo Ran Rashomon It goes without saying that Kurosawa Akira is one of the most famous and well regarded filmmakers of at least the past 70 years, and I'd hazard to say of all time. Despite having passed away two decades ago, he may well still be considered one of the most famous Japanese citizens on the world stage. Of course, even a great creator like Kurosawa doesn't just influence others, they first need to receive inspiration themselves. For Kurosawa, often considered the most westernized of Japan's great directors, one might point to Shakespeare,、uh, on whose works the director based some of his most famous films. But while Kurosawa did love and respect the bard, the Western literary influence did not end with the Anglosphere. From a young age, Kurosawa obsessed over the works of the Russian literary giants Dostoevsky, Gogol, Tolstoy, and many others. This relationship with Russia would not only serve as a direct inspiration for multiple films Kurosawa would go on to make, but would also result in a lifeline being tossed to Kurosawa in his darkest moments, one which would help bring him back from the brink. This is the incredible story of one of the world's greatest directors and his unique relationship with Russia and the Soviet Union. This is how the Kremlin saved Kurosawa. Konnichiwa. Tobarishi and Tobadachi, and welcome back to Unseen Japan, your one stop spot for in depth dives into Japanese history, culture, and current events. I'm Noah Oskow, and today we'll be taking a look at one of my personal favorite directors and his unique history with Russia and the Soviet Union. If you want more high quality content focusing on Japanese history, culture, film, and more, give us a like or a subscribe, and maybe consider supporting us on Patreon. Anyway, the Vaikya Natsnium. Let's get started. Kurosawa Akira was born in Tokyo in 1910, the youngest of eight children, to Kurosawa Isamu and his wife Shima. Akira gained a love of narrative from an early age thanks to his father's interests in film, but he was perhaps just as influenced by his older brother, Heigo. Four years Akira's senior, Heigo was a source of great admiration for his younger brother, and was by his brother's admission addicted to Russian literature. Heigo and his sisters would lend Akira their books, which the young boy would read vociferously on the walk to and from school. Akira first wanted to become a painter, and ended up living with his beloved brother Heigo when that chosen career, and later on work on an illegal underground left wing newspaper, dried up. The two of them occupied a tiny flophouse room in a crowded tenement alleyway, with Akira spending his extra time reading and going to the movies. Heigo's obsession with Russian literature continued, and he made his living as a popular benshi, a narrator for silent films. At the time when silent films were still the norm, These narrators, skilled at performing multiple characters and exciting large movie theater crowds, could become celebrities in their own right. But the emergence of talkie films from abroad spelled doom for Hago's profession. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Leading to one of the great tragedies of Akira's life, his brother's suicide. Heiko's death continued to haunt Akira for the rest of his life, but the mutual love of Russian literature he shared with his brother did not dissipate. Now, the sole surviving male child in his family, Akira felt responsible for providing for his mother and father, and began desperately searching for work. A chancing glance at a classified section of his father's newspaper led to a job with Toho Studios. Kurosawa had stumbled into being a filmmaker. Akira worked steadfastly as an assistant director for the next seven years, finally landing his first full directorial job with his judo film Sanshiro Sugata in 1943. Despite heavy editing by the Japanese wartime censors, the film was quite successful, 
Kurosawa's star had begun to shine. He made three more films while the Second World War raged on, and then continued his work under a different, but according to Kurosawa, more relaxed, form of censorship during the American occupation that followed. Another landmark came when Kurosawa first worked with the actor whose name is most synonymous with his films, Mifune Toshiro. Their work in 1948's successful Drunken Angel was the first of a legendary 16 films the two made together. It was after Drunken Angel that Kurosawa first turned to a Russian story as a professional outing. Toho Cinemas was experiencing a strike, and Kurosawa, still wanting to put food on his family's table, decided to direct some plays in the meantime. One of which was Chekhov's one-act farce, The Proposal, or Predlozhenie. The income from this tided him over until his next film, The Quiet Duel, in 1949. Kurosawa ultimately began work on an adaptation of Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Idiot. He cast his right-hand man, Mifune Toshiro, as the film's version of the roguish Rogojin, Harasetsuko known in Japan as the Eternal Virgin, or Eien no Shoujo, and made legendary for her roles in Ozu Yasujiro's films, was cast as the Japanese version of the bewitching and tortured Natasha Filipovna. Unfortunately, Kurosawa's love for the novel was also his undoing. In the end, he delivered a massive 225 minute film. At nearly 4 hours, this movie was longer than the infamously lengthy Gone with the Wind. The producers believed such a film to be unmarketable and ordered Kurosawa to perform massive cuts for his passion project. Despite protestations that it would be better to cut the film lengthwise, that is, vertically in half, the director still managed to whittle away 45 minutes, and presented a 180 minute version of the premiere, but following negative reactions, the studio cut it down even further. Kurosawa would later say, Of all my films, people wrote to me most about this one. I had wanted to make The Idiot long before Rashomon. Since I was little, I'd liked Russian literature, but I find that I liked Dostoevsky the best, and had long thought that this book would make a wonderful film. He is still my favorite author, and he is the one, I still think, who writes most honestly about human existence. The failure of the idiot did nothing to slow Kurosawa down. In fact, his very next film, Ikiru, from 1945, was also based in part on another Russian classic, Tolstoy's late-stage novella, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, or Tsmirt Ivana Ilyich. <laughs> I hope my pronunciation isn't too terrible. This tale of a middle-aged bureaucratic mediocrity dealing with a terminal illness found great critical success, and remains one of Kurosawa's most enduring films. What followed became Kurosawa's golden age, as the director pumped out critical and financial darlings consistently for the next 15 years. Kurosawa was at the height of his powers, finding incredible success in both Japan and abroad, with Rashomon and then Seven Samurai and then Yojimbo having transformed him into Japan's first international film icon. This period also gave birth to other timeless classics, including The Lower Depths from 1957, which was based on a play by Russian playwright Maxim Gorky, Throne of Blood, The Hidden Fortress from 1958, which was famously the major inspiration for George Lucas's Star Wars, High and Low in 1963, and Redbeard in 1965. By now, Kurosawa was so well known abroad that American producers were begging to take the director on. Kurosawa's journey to Hollywood, however, would be a disaster. One of the films Kurosawa was working on for a Hollywood company, Runaway Train, was never even produced, and the famed director was booted from the production of Tora 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 within weeks of the start of filming, under rumors that he was suffering a mental breakdown. Returning to Japan after two fruitless and frustrating years abroad, Kurosawa's attempt at a rebound film, Dodeskaden, in 1970, was a box office failure. With rumors swirling about the director's mental health and facing a Japanese film industry that no longer wanted to finance his films, Kurosawa had reached his darkest hour. He attempted suicide. Thankfully, Kurosawa Akira survived the attempt, and even recovered fairly quickly at least physically speaking. And yet, he was sure his days as a filmmaker were over. It was here that the Soviet Union stepped in. The 
the homeland of the literature that had inspired and influenced so much of Kurosawa Akira's life, had now come to know Kurosawa Akira in kind. Mosfilm, the Soviet Union's largest production company, had decided they wanted to enlist a Japanese director for a film based on a Russian novel that would promote Siberia. Who could possibly have been better for that than the most famous Japanese director of all, and one who was well known to love Russian literature? Kurosawa had suddenly gained a chance to return to filmmaking from a most unexpected source. And soon, the director was on an Aeroflot plane headed to Moscow. But what Russian novel should he choose? Kurosawa had read so many. Kurosawa's future Russian co-director, Vladimir Nikolaevich Vasilyev, explained it like this. When it was decided that we'd be having Kurosawa direct a film for us, the first book he suggested for us was Taras Bulba by Gogol. This was a Cossack story, and since Sergei Bondarchuk, director of War and Peace, was already preparing to film a version of it, it was out of the competition. The next book Kurosawa put forward was Dersu Uzala. Since this had been filmed two times before in the USSR, the Soviet side wasn't so sure. But it was all decided when Kurosawa insisted by saying, I'd absolutely like to go with this. Der Tsutsala is the 1923 memoir of the exploration of the Russian Far East by Vladimir Arseniev, who was assisted on many expeditions by the eponymous Nanai tribesman Der Tsuzala. In fact, Kurosawa had first read the book decades earlier, and had even hoped to film a version of it in the late 1930s before scrapping the idea. Unlike The Idiot and The Lower Depths, he had decided it needed its true Russian setting. The fact that the director had pulled such an obscure, at least by non-Russian standards, yet so appropriate Russian novel from his back catalog of Russian literature was surprising and impressed his Soviet counterparts. Vasilyev's interpreter and moderator during the interview, Ikeda Masahiro, had this to say. It seems that the Soviet side was quite surprised when Kurosawa suggested Der Tsutsala. While Dostoyevsky and Tolstoy's works were also listed as candidates, what truly surprised them was how much Russian literature Kurosawa had read. They had heard that he had read even War and Peace itself about 10 times. Even if some other Japanese film director from around 1975 had been called upon by the Soviet Union, it's highly doubtful that anyone else would have said they wanted to film Der Tsuozala. Sometime later, Kurosawa was back in Russia, flying over the Siberian taiga on the way to the distant Primorsky Krai, and the town of Arseniev, named after the author of Der Tsutsala. With him on the journey, ironically taking him thousands of miles away from Moscow but not terribly far away from Hokkaido, were but four close Japanese associates and an entire Russian crew. As he looked out the window and down towards the never-ending sea of trees, Kurosawa was heard to say, You know, Chekhov said that the beauty of the taiga lies in its vastness, but how do you show that in a film? Over the next two grueling years, Kurosawa did everything he could to show the power, the beauty, and the terror of that Siberian landscape. He and his crew endured blistering heat in the summer and negative 30 degree winters, endless swarms of mosquitoes and ticks that would emerge from the swampland, and struggled to work their way through linguistic differences and beguiling Soviet filming requirements, such as subpar film stock and strictly enforced daily shooting quotas. They grew close to their Russian counterparts, developing lasting friendships through the intense effort of creating a film in such an extreme environment. The result is a film that is often called one of Kurosawa's most visually stunning. Der Tsuotsala released in Japan to fairly good box office results, but middling reviews. Around the world, however, the film fared much better. It sold 20.4 million tickets in the Soviet Union. Whether or not those ticket numbers were inflated or purchased by the state, I couldn't say. But either way, it's a huge amount. It also raked in $1.2 million at the North American box office, and was awarded two major honors. The Golden Prize at the 9th Moscow International Film Festival, and an Oscar for Best Foreign Film at the 1976 Academy Awards. And the winner is the USSR for Dasu Utsala. Neither Kurosawa nor most film expected this win, 
leading it to be accepted by an entirely unrelated Soviet director who just happened to be present at the time. I don't speak English, but thank you very much. Kurosawa later returned to Moscow, where a party was held in his honor, and he was finally able to see the Academy Award he had won. According to his co-director Vasilyev, it had been passed immediately on to the KGB after the Academy Awards, and no one involved in filming had even laid eyes on the trophy for the following six months. Kurosawa intended to make a second film in Russia, to be entitled Mask of the Red Death, and he even wanted to use the star of Dersu Tsala again. But this film slipped through the cracks after he returned to Japan. Here, Kurosawa's direct interaction with Russia and his recreation of narratives from that nation halted. But the connection gained from those stories, stories he had read while clutching books borrowed from his older brother as he walked to and from school, these remained. Deretsu Zala did not save Kurosawa's domestic career in Japan, but instead it started a trend of his films being financed and watched in large part from foreign sources. However, this offer from the Soviet Union may have saved Kurosawa himself, allowing him to return to the creative work that gave him so much life. As Kurosawa himself said, Watashi kara eiga o hitara, zero koto daro. Take me, subtract movies, and you'll get zero. Kurosawa directed four more films in his lifetime, at least two of which are often considered masterpieces. As for Kurosawa's Oscar from Dertsu Utsala, it remains at most film, where it sits in a glass case in the executive boardroom. The connection between Kurosawa and Russia lasts to this day. Alright, Tovarishi and Tomodachi, thank you for giving this video a watch until the end. This video was actually based on the first ever article I wrote for Unseen Japan, so it was a lot of fun to return to it and to make it into a video. Also want to give a nice shout out to my good friend Illuminabi for the cover art for this uh, video. It's really awesome and he's been providing a lot of our art recently for the website and for YouTube too, so go check out his Instagram and his Twitter. His stuff is pretty gnarly, pretty cool. Kurosawa's career was long and fascinating, and all 30 of his films are worth a watch. If you like this video, give us a like and a subscribe, and if you want to support us, we'd be so honored if you join our Patreon. Link is down below. If you enjoyed this video, also feel free to check out my most recent work on Japan's forgotten Micronesian colonies, or on how a Jewish folk song made it huge in Japan. Anyway, look forward to seeing you all next time. The Skorova and Johnny.